Hi, I'm Tom, coming to you from the internationally acclaimed Sourdough Baking Institute of Cleveland, Ohio, also known as My Kitchen. Thank you for selecting my video. Now, I've made a number of videos on my YouTube channel, The Sourdough Journey, but I have not made one that shows how to create a sourdough starter. I created my starter about 11 months ago, and I started making those videos shortly thereafter, but I already had my starter created. Now, we finally have the opportunity to see how a starter is created because I am ready to create my second own sourdough starter. So I'll take you through this entire process. Now, before I go any further, who is this video for? This video is for beginners who want to create their sourdough starter for the first time. I'll go through this in great detail. If you're an experienced baker or you have an existing sourdough starter, I have some other videos already created, one that includes steps of how to maintain an existing sourdough starter. I have a video that describes how to strengthen a weak sourdough starter. And I have a humorous video called 50 Ways to Kill Your Starter that talks about all the ways people accidentally kill or try to kill their starter and how to save your starter from common mishaps. In this video, we'll start from the very beginning. What is a sourdough starter? How do you create one? And then we'll get into a little bit of how you maintain it on an ongoing basis. Now the first step in sourdough baking is to get your hands on a sourdough starter. There are many ways to do this. You can buy a sourdough starter already pre-made on the internet. There are places that sell them either in dehydrated form or in fresh form. That's a perfectly acceptable way to get started. If you have a friend who's a sourdough baker, you could ask them to give you some of their starter and then you can cultivate that into your own. You can go to a local bakery that makes sourdough bread and you could ask a bakery if they would give you some of their starter. Some bakeries are sensitive about this. They don't give it out. Other bakeries are happy to give some of their sourdough starter to a baker. Now there are all kinds of starters out there in the world. Some sourdough starters have been handed down through generations. There are people in the US who have sourdough starter cultures that they've been maintaining since the mid 1800s from the California gold rush. There are people in Europe who have 400 year old starters that have been handed down through generations. And there was recently a person who went to Egypt and took some dehydrated starter off of a baking vessel that was estimated to be 4,500 years old, reactivated that sourdough starter and baked bread using a 4,500 year old starter. So it's a pretty amazing, versatile and long lived microorganism. It's been on the earth for over a billion years. But if you cannot get your hands on a 4,500 year old Egyptian baking vessel, I'll show you the easy way to make a sourdough starter in your kitchen. Now, what is a sourdough starter exactly? A sourdough starter is a living biological culture of wild yeast and lactic acid bacteria. This is the way bread has been made for over 4,000 years. This started in the Fertile Crescent and in Egypt, where there are the first remnants of baking facilities found in archaeological locations there. The Egyptians initially mixed a porridge of water and wheat, and they would eat that for sustenance, and they would bake flat bread out of that because it wouldn't rise. It didn't have the yeast in it. And then some Egyptian baker left some of his wet dough sitting out overnight and came back the next day or two days later and found this wet porridge had basically doubled in size. And all of a sudden this Egyptian baker had discovered the yeast that creates a sourdough culture that leavens or rises the bread. So then now they had this magic porridge that would double in size overnight. And by keeping some of that wet porridge overnight, day after day after day, you could maintain this magic porridge that would be doubling and bubbly and would cause flat bread to turn into risen or leaven bread. That's really how bread originated. What we're creating is that culture of yeast and other microbes that are exactly the same as what was done 4,000 years ago when the first leaven bread was discovered. 
So from ancient times up to the 20th century, people used a sourdough culture to make bread. What's in a sourdough culture? Two basic microorganisms. One is yeast. The yeast is what causes the bread to rise and lactic acid bacteria. Lactic acid bacteria is what assists the yeast in the fermentation process and it gives sourdough bread that tangy flavor. It's essentially creating two types of acid. Lactic acid, which is the tangy flavor that you get in yogurt, for example, and acetic acid, which is the biting acetic, acidic flavor that you get in vinegar, for example. The lactic acid bacteria is creating both of those things. The yeast is creating ethanol, which is a alcohol. That's why yeast is used in brewing and creating wine and things of that nature. But it's also creating carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide basically fills your dough with air and that's what causes the bread to rise. So the two things that you're trying to grow in your culture are the yeast, which rises the dough, and the lactic acid bacteria, which gives it that signature sour flavor. Now this is the way bread was made for centuries. This was great for using it to bake bread in small bakeries, but in the 20th century, when people decided it would be better to make bread in a factory, this is a very unpredictable way to make bread in a factory. So that's when commercial yeast was created. Commercial yeast was created in a laboratory by taking all the strains of wild yeast from sourdough cultures and finding the one strongest, most robust and most stable species or strain of yeast. And they isolated that and reproduced that in a factory. And that's what you get in these little baggies. This is one strain of yeast that's been separated from the lactic acid bacteria and reproduced in a factory. And it does one thing really well. It basically eats sugar and creates carbon dioxide. So when scientists created commercial yeast in a factory, they were able to separate for the first time since the beginning of time, they separated yeast from its symbiotic partner, the lactic acid bacteria, and they were able to separate those two. So now you can buy yeast in a bag that doesn't include lactic acid bacteria, but that's why bread that you eat now, non-sourdough bread, commercially yeasted bread, just doesn't taste very good because you took out the flavor enhancers of the lactic acid bacteria that gives sourdough that unique flavor. So that's why we create our own starter because it does two things. One, it uses wild yeast to rise the dough. And along with that wild yeast comes its symbiotic partner, the lactic acid bacteria, which gives the sourdough its unique flavor. So the two microbes that are in the sourdough starter, yeast and lactic acid bacteria, these have traveled together through the history of time going back millions of years. When you find one, you find the other because they have a symbiotic relationship. They both eat similar foods, starches and sugars. The lactic acid bacteria consumes some sugars and gives them off in a different format that allows the yeast to then eat them and digest them. The yeast gives off alcohol and carbon dioxide. The lactic acid bacteria creates acid and the two of those cr together create an environment that's perfectly suited for the two of them to exist, but because it's acidic and it's alcoholic, it basically fends off other microbes. So it creates an environment where you can let a sourdough starter sit on your countertop, non-refrigerated for a really long period of time, and mold won't grow in it, other pathogens won't grow in it, other bacteria won't grow in it, because these two microorganisms have created this perfect environment that they cohabitate in symbiotically, and they keep out other bacteria. So what are the ingredients that we need to create a sourdough starter? You need two ingredients, flour and water. Now there are sourdough recipes on the internet where people talk about all kinds of other ingredients that you want to add to your sourdough starter. They'll talk about adding sugar, honey, pineapple juice, kefir, raisin water, all kinds of crazy stuff. You don't need any of those things. All you need is flour and water. So you might ask the question, well, if I just start with flour and water, where does the yeast come from if I'm not adding it? The yeast is already attached to the flour. 
Now, when you create a sourdough starter, the yeast theoretically can come from three places. The yeast is already on the flour because the yeast is everywhere. There's yeast on my counter. There's yeast in wheat fields. There's yeast in the back of a truck that the uh, wheat berries were dumped into. The yeast is already everywhere in the environment. And where you have yeast, you have lactic acid bacteria with it. So in this bag of flour, I already have the other ingredients that I need, the yeast cells and the lactic acid bacteria cells. They're just dormant because this is dry. So that's the primary place where your yeast comes from is it's already in this bag. The second place the yeast comes from is it's in the air. So when you're mixing a sourdough starter, some people will say you need to leave it open to the air so that all the yeast that's in the air can get into your sourdough starter. Very, very little of the, the yeast that ultimately is in your starter comes from the air. You could make a sourdough starter by completely sealing up your jar airtight. It's a completely anaerobic process, meaning it doesn't need oxygen. It does not need yeast from the air. You don't need to leave the top open. You don't need to put it outside. You don't need to try to attract yeast into your jar of your starter culture. And then the third place where yeast comes from is from the baker's hands. This is interesting. There have been some studies that show that uh, people who work in bakeries for long periods of time actually have yeast all over their bodies and they'll have yeast in their hands and they'll have enough yeast in the crevices of their hands where you could actually theoretically take sterile flour and if somebody rubbed their hands on that sterile flour, they have enough yeast on their hands that it would, you'd be able to create a sourdough culture off of a baker's hands. I tend to wash my hands a little bit more frequently and I don't bake bread that often, so I don't think I could start a sourdough culture off of my hands, but you'll hear people say that as well and that has been proven to be true. But 99.9% .9 of the yeast that we need for our sourdough culture is already attached to the flour. Now let's talk about making the starter. The recipe and process that I use is from Chad Robertson's Tartine Bread Sourdough Baking Book. This has a recipe and a process for how to create the starter on page 45. This is also available on the Tartine Bakery website. You can find the recipe for the basic country loaf, which is the standard recipe in this book. It also has in that recipe how to create the starter. It's the same thing that's in the book. That's what I'm going to be following here. He does not give precise measurements for a couple of the ingredients, so I'm going to add some specific measurements here in the video to help out the beginners who wouldn't know what a handful of flour would equal in terms of grams, for example. So let's follow this recipe. As I mentioned, there are two ingredients we need to make our starter. We need flour and water. Now, according to the tartine recipe, the flour that's recommended is a 50-50 mix of bread flour and whole wheat flour. Now, I recommend following this mix to get your starter going. Once you get your starter established and you want to maintain your starter on an ongoing basis, you can change up your mix of flours if you prefer. But really to get it established, I strongly recommend following this mix. So what I'm using is for my bread flour, I'm using Central Milling Company Organic Artisan Baker's Craft Flour. This is a bread flour from the Central Milling Company. And for the whole wheat flour, I'm using Central Milling Company Organic Whole Wheat High Protein Medium Grind Flour. So 50% bread flour, 50% whole wheat flour. Now, we're going to need to add this mixture into the starter every day for say seven to 10 days. So what I recommend is rather than dragging out two bags of flour every day is make a blend of this to start. So I'll do that right here. So what I prefer to do is to use these plastic containers. This holds about three cups or 750 milliliters and I'll mix up 50% of the bread flour, 50% of the whole wheat flour. I can fit about 350 grams of flour in here with a little bit of spare room. I know that from experience. So I'm going to add 175 grams of bread flour and 175 grams of whole wheat flour. 
Now this is a pre-mix. I leave a little bit of room in the top and this will last me for about a week of feeding the starter. So I leave some room in the top so that I have room to shake, shake, shake and mix these together. So what I'm doing is creating my 50-50 blend of bread flour and whole wheat flour. Now I don't need to get my bags out every day. I don't have to spill flour everywhere. This is a much cleaner, easier way to do your daily maintenance of your starter. So we have our 50-50 mix of our flours. I label my container here so I know that I have 50% of the artisan baker's craft flour, 50% of the whole wheat flour. The second ingredient that I need is water. So people often ask the question, what type of water is best to use for your sourdough starter? The answer is you should use non-chlorinated water. Now there are many different ways to get non-chlorinated water. What I just did is I have chlorinated water coming through my tap from my municipal water supply, but I have a filter on my refrigerator that filters the chlorine out of it. So I have non-chlorinated water now. You can take chlorinated water, you can let it sit on your countertop overnight and the chlorine will aerate off of the water. You can boil it and you can boil chlorine off of the water. You can buy bottled water, you can buy spring water, you could use distilled water. People don't recommend using distilled water because that's stripped all the minerals out of the water. And then one other thing to remember is that if you're using municipal water and you're filtering it, you should find out what type of chlorination is in your water because there are two types that are used at least in the US now. One is chlorine and the other is chloramine. Chloramine is a combination of chlorine and ammonia that's actually more stable than chlorine but it's harder to get that out of your water. So if you have chloramine in your water, the only way to get that out is by boiling it for, I believe, 20 minutes. You could check with your local municipality to see what they recommend for removing chloramine from your water because it's not filtered out through normal household filters and it does not aerate off by leaving it on your counter and it does not boil off by simply bringing it to a boil. You have to boil it for a longer period of time than that. Now, some people will say that they read on the internet or a friend told them that they can use chlorinated tap water to create their starter and it'll work out just fine. If you use chlorinated tap water to create your starter, the goal of your starter is to basically grow bacteria in a jar. And if you add chlorine into your jar where you're trying to grow bacteria, it's just like adding household bleach to your starter, which according to the label says, kills 99.9% .9 of germs and bacteria. Why would I want to put that in my starter? It doesn't make any sense. Make sure your water's not chlorinated. Other people will say, well, my friend said they just use tap water in their starter. Tap water can mean a hundred different things. Some people's tap water comes from a mountain spring. Some people's tap water is from a well that's been filtered through reverse osmosis filtration. Some people's tap water includes chlorine, some includes chloramine, some doesn't. So when people say they use tap water, just ignore that because it doesn't mean anything. Everybody's tap water can be different. Figure out what's in your water, take the chlorine out. It's the best way to do it. Now we talked about the type of flour that we want to use. So we're using half bread flour, half whole wheat flour. But what we didn't talk about is where your flour comes from. Now this is where things get really interesting. Now there are about a half dozen different strains of yeast that you'll find in a wild sourdough culture. And there are probably 30 different strains of lactic acid bacteria in sourdough cultures from all around the world. And there are people who research this so when you create your first sourdough culture, as I mentioned, the vast majority of the yeast and lactic acid bacteria is coming from the flour that you're using. Now, when I created my first starter, I used mostly King Arthur flour. King Arthur is a popular flour company in Vermont in the United States. So I used King Arthur flour. So my yeast and lactic acid bacteria came from King Arthur, from Vermont and from I'm guessing the East Coast. 
I don't know exactly where all the flour comes from. They could be sourcing it from all over the US typically. But let me just call this my East Coast flour. And then I fed this over time with other flours, but mostly King Arthur flours. So this is what I call my Cleveland starter. This is CLE. That's the short name for the airport code. That's what the young people down in the 216 call it, CLE. But what I'm gonna create now is I wanna create a California starter. I wanna experiment and see if I buy flour from California, would that actually create a different strain of yeast and different strains of lactic acid bacteria than, I, than what I have here in the CLE. So my new starter is going to be called Cali. I was going to write California on here, but I didn't make enough room on my tape. So this one's called Cali. And what I'm gonna do is use only flour that comes from California. These are from the Central Milling Company in Petaluma, California. And I'm assuming that this flour was sourced from California. If it wasn't, don't tell me because I wanna believe that. And most importantly, I want my starter to believe that. The water that I'm using is filtered water from Cleveland, but I assume that that wouldn't impact the outcome because you're not getting yeast or lactic acid bacteria from the water. It's all coming from the flour. I'm gonna keep the lid on this so that I'm not introducing local yeasts and lactic acid bacteria into this as much as possible. And lastly, I really wanna convince this starter that it's in California, so I grew my hair out long. I'm trying to learn how to surf. I really want this starter to think it lives in California. So we're gonna create a California starter today in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay, we're ready to mix up our starter. You need a vessel that you wanna mix it in. I recommend these straight-sided canning jars. These are called ball jars from the United States. This is one pint or about 500 milliliters. Uh, I prefer a straight-sided vessel so that you can get your spoon in there to scrape down the sides. I originally tried using something like this. This is really tough because you can't get your spoon in there to scrape it down and the starter gets all gunked up and crusty around that lid. So don't overcomplicate things with that. You could use a clear plastic container. You could use something like this. You'll wanna have something that you could put a loose or tight fitting lid on. So I use these plastic lids that you can buy separately with these canning jars. These come with the two part metal lids. I don't like the two part lids. I just buy these plastic replacements. So the first step is to combine flour and water. The recipe calls for a very imprecise measurement. He says to fill up the container halfway and then add handfuls of flour until it creates a thick batter. That's a very imprecise measurement system. So what I would recommend is let's start with 75 grams of flour and 75 grams of water. So I have my flour blend here. Now this quantity is somewhat arbitrary just based on my experience, but I'm recommending 75 grams of flour. And I have my filtered non-chlorinated water. I'm adding 75 grams of that. There we are. So we have a total of 150 grams of new starter in a clean jar. Now I'm gonna mix this up. You wanna mix this really thoroughly. And it should create what Chad Robertson calls is a thick batter with no lumps. So I can see there are no lumps in here, but what's a thick batter? I mean, a thick batter is a very subjective term. Here's how I define a thick batter. I can go like this. I can turn this upside down and it won't pour out. That's a definition in my book of a good mix for a starter. So that's it, that's all there is to it for mixing your flour and water. Now, I'm gonna put a lid on this, but I'm not gonna seal it tightly. So I'm gonna let a little bit of air in here, even though it's not required. This would work in an anaerobic, oxygen-free environment. But I screw this lid on, and then I just back it off slightly to leave a little bit of air space in there. So I don't want foreign objects kind of falling down into my starter dust or things like that, because that could introduce other pathogens in here. But I'm gonna leave a little air space to let some of the carbon dioxide out 
and let a little bit of oxygen in there even though you don't need oxygen. Now, the recipe says keep this in a cool, dark place for two to three days. Very important. Why is it important to keep it in a cool place? Because I'm trying to grow my yeast and my lactic acid bacteria, and there are other bacteria in this starter right now. You might not realize it because when you buy a bag of flour, it's white and it looks real clean. Flour is a raw food. It is not a sterilized food. So you're getting basically whatever was in the wheat field is in that bag and it can include all kinds of other bacteria. Let me just put it that way. Those are in my starter now. So what's going to happen here in the first few days of your starter is there is an epic battle going on in this jar where the yeast and the lactic acid bacteria are trying to fight off all the other bacteria that's in that uh, flour and you want the yeast and the lactic acid bacteria to win that race. So what, what you want is a relatively cool temperature. I'm going to put this in an upstairs room here where my temperature is about 69 degrees, 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius. What that'll do is it'll let the yeast get established and it'll slow down the development of some of these other bacteria and allow the yeast to get a little bit of a head start because the other bacteria far outnumber the yeast cells. If you put this in a warm environment, sometimes bad stuff will happen and all the other bacteria will take over before the yeast has a chance to establish itself. So that's the reason we want a cool environment. You also want to keep it in a dark place. Similarly, just to keep that sunlight out so you don't get the sunlight accelerating the development of everything, anything. So I'm going to cover this with a dark towel. I'm going to put this in one of my cool rooms and we're going to come back and check this each day. But this will take about two to three days where you don't want to touch this. You don't want to stir it. You don't want to do anything to it. I'm going to open the jar once a day. I'm going to inspect what's in there. I'll show you how it looks, but you don't want to add anything to it. You just want to let it sit for about two to three days. Okay, it's day two. It's been 24 hours since we mixed our starter. Let's take a look. Now, the first thing that I do is I want to smell this as soon as I open this jar. Now, this still smells like bread flour. It smells like wheat. I'm not really smelling a lot more than that in here now. But as we look in here, let's see what it looks like. Now, as you look down into this jar, you'll see some dark areas. That's just a shadow coming through the side of this jar because of this printing on the jar. That's not a discoloration of the starter. It's all the same, basically, cream color. It's just casting a shadow on it. So what I do see here is what I expected is I see a few bubbles. That's a good sign. Bubbles means life. There's some life in our starter, but it's pretty flat. The smell hasn't changed very much. Pretty much what I would expect after 24 hours. Let's check this again tomorrow. It's day three, 48 hours since we initially mixed this. Let's take a look. Now we've got some action happening here. This is a good sign. So this will typically happen around day three or day four. This is where this battle among all the microbes that are in here is going on. And you're seeing this frothy bubbling on the top of this, very typical after two or three days. And now let's look at the side view. There's something really important here. You can see those small streaks on the side of the jar show that this actually rose and fell. Now that's just evidence of a lot of bacterial activity happening in the jar. And this is what people call is evidence that the bad bacteria is burning off. You'll see this frothy, thin, milky type of froth on the top of it. This is very typical. Now some people will also get tricked at this point and they'll say, oh my gosh, my starter, it's been going for two days and it's already doubling in size. I saw it rise, I'm gonna bake some bread. You don't want to bake bread with this because this still has foreign pathogens in it that are not healthy for humans to eat. So you'll see this activity and sometimes be deceived in thinking that this is the yeast activity. It's not. It's all the bacteria fighting in here and just giving off their different byproducts. So you don't want to be eating this stuff on day two or day three. Let's cover it for one more day, see what it looks like tomorrow.
Okay, it's day four, 72 hours since we mixed this up. Let's take a look. Now this smells more vinegary today, so that means that the lactic acid bacteria is now giving off its byproduct of acetic acid. So now if we look down in here, this looks different than it looked yesterday. It's flattened out. You see small bubbles all around here and it's lost that frothiness. That's a good sign because this is what an immature starter should look like. Just kind of that flat with those pinhole sized bubbles on the top. So on day four, now we're ready to start feeding this. So this sat for 72 hours from when we initially mixed it. It may take one extra day, it may take one less day, but when it starts to flatten out like this and look like it's settling in with those small pinhole size bubbles, we're ready to feed this and start moving into the next stage of building our starter, which is feeding. So now that we're entering the next phase of building our starter, which is the daily feeding, we need to understand the concept of starter feeding ratios. The feeding ratio is typically expressed as three numbers. So it's three numbers in series separated by two colons. And what this is, is the ratio of the first number, which is your starter that you want to keep. The second number is the ratio of flour that you want to add. The third number is the ratio of water that you want to add. So if I wanted to keep equal parts, starter, flour, and water, I would do a one, one, one ratio. That means equal parts starter, equal parts flour, equal parts water. The tartine recipe as you're building your starter recommends a one, two, two ratio. So we're gonna have one part starter, two parts flour, and two parts water. Now you have to determine how many grams do you want in that first number? That's how you determine the second number and the third number. What I recommend is to keep 25 grams of your existing starter. So that's gonna be the one in the one to two ratio. So that's 25 grams of starter, 50 grams of flour, 50 grams of water. The second and third number are ratios off of the first number. So it's one part starter, two parts flour, two parts water. Now I have 150 grams of starter in this jar right now. If you remember, we, we began this process by adding 75 grams of water and 75 grams of flour. I only need 25 grams of this to continue. So I'm going to discard 125 grams of my existing starter and I'm going to keep 25 grams going forward. And you'll get the hang of this. We're gonna do it every day. We're gonna discard a portion and we're going to keep a portion so I need to keep 25 grams. I could create a second jar and take out 25 grams and put it into a second jar and then go from there, but I'm out of jars, so I need to get this out of this jar, put 25 grams back in, and then start from there in this same jar. So what I'm gonna do is just pour this out into this little red bowl, completely empty this jar, then I can set this on my scale set the scale to zero, and then add back 25 grams of my starter into this, which is all I wanna keep. So let me do that. So when I pour this out, th this is really liquefied over that three day period that it's been sitting there. So this actually pours out almost the consistency of paint. So I've emptied out my jar completely. I've put it into this separate bowl. Now I can reset my jar to zero on my scale. And now I just wanna add in 25 grams of this to go forward. So I have 25 grams, that's the first number in my feeding ratio, that's the one equals 25. So now if I wanna add two times flour and two times water to that, I get my blend. So you can remember we mixed up our blend here, very easy, I don't have to get my bags out. So now I wanna add two times 25 flour, so that would be 50 grams of flour. And I wanna add two times that 25 grams of starter as water, so I'm keeping my flour water ratios the same. So I add 50 grams of water. There we are. So that's my new feeding ratio, one, two, two, which is 25, 50, 50. 25 grams of old starter, 50 grams of flour, 50 grams of water. We're gonna do this every day for about a week. And then I like to wipe off the rim of the jar because you'll get some really crusty, nasty stuff around the top of that. You wanna keep the sides scraped down completely. 
Really keep that starter down in the bottom of your jar. Keep your sides clean. This is a great tool that somebody recommended. This is called a spoonula, I guess because its mother is a spoon and its father is a spatula, but it basically works like a spoon for scooping out the flour. And it also has this flexible tip for scraping down the sides, spoonula. Perfect tool for this process. Okay, now we also changed something else here. Now that we fed this, it's starting to establish itself as a sourdough culture. So I don't need to keep this at a cool room temperature anymore. I can keep this at a warm room temperature. So really the optimal temperature for a sourdough starter is between 76 degrees Fahrenheit and 82 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 24.4 degrees Celsius and 27.8 degrees Celsius. So in my kitchen, my kitchen's a little bit cooler than that, but on top of my refrigerator where the compressor throws off a little bit of heat, it's a little warmer on top of my refrigerator than it is just sitting on my countertop. My countertop is about 74 degrees Fahrenheit or 23 degrees Celsius. So I keep my starters up on top of my fridge. So now that we've started daily feeding, we also want to start to monitor the starter to see if it's rising. So after I fed this, I put this rubber band around here. I just took a rubber band and colored it black with marker around here. So now I'm going to watch this throughout the day and see if the starter rises throughout the day. Okay, I've been watching the starter throughout the day. We're eight hours since I did the one, two, two feeding. This starter is doubling now after eight hours. Here's what it looks like. You can see the rubber band shows where we started. It's clearly doubled in height. You can see I had this on my refrigerator at 77, 78 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 25, 25 and a half degrees Celsius. So we're getting a really good rise here where it's doubling in height. Eight hours is a little bit of a long time for your starter to double. We want to see that happening in about four hours. And that's really the indication that our starter is ready. But day four is really early in this process. Normally this would take six, seven or eight days. Now it did not happen with this batch of starter, but another thing that's very common when you're making a new starter is that between days three, four, and five, you'll really get a quiet period with the starter where it looks like it's not doing anything. It'll just sit there flat. Don't panic. Don't try to do anything to it. Don't try to add anything to it. Just stick with the daily feeding maintenance and just have patience. That's all I can say. This one happened to be very active on day four. That's a little bit uncommon. Usually day four is a quiet day. So now it's day five. So the last time we saw this yesterday on day four, it had doubled in height after about eight hours. Now look at it the next day on day five, it's completely flattened out again. You see those bubbles on top? That's a good sign that it's alive. But this is the typical starter feeding cycle. So you feed it, it'll rise over a four to eight hour period, then it'll gradually come back down and it flattens out in bubbles. So when it flattens out like that, what that means is it's consumed all the food and it's ready for another feeding. So this is what I would call a hungry starter where it's really flattened out again and you see all those little pinpoint holes on the top. Now what you don't wanna see is a starving starter. Your starter is starving when it's completely flat. There are very few bubbles on the top and you start to see a thin layer of what's called hooch, which is ethanol or alcohol. That's a byproduct that the yeast gives off after it's consumed all the starches and sugars in the flour. So now every day we do the one, two, two feeding again. So I'm going to pour off all but 25 grams of this and then add 50 grams of flour, 50 grams of water. Same thing that we did yesterday. Now, like I said, you can use two jars or you should also weigh your jar before you put your starter in it. I know that this weighs 285 grams, so I can pour this off. And I know that if it weighs 310 grams, I have 25 grams of starter left in it. That's also another way to get at your starting point. And then you also want to discard that remaining starter. You don't want to keep that. Once your starter is established after say 10 days to two weeks, you can start saving your discard. And there are all kinds of recipes that you can use for starter discard. You can find those on the King Arthur website. They have a, a, a lot of different ideas for how to use it.
But in this first week or two, you wanna make sure that all that bad bacteria has burned itself off of your starter. So don't hang on to your discard, just keep the 25 grams and get rid of the rest each day. I put mine into my compost bin. I like to think of that as some of the yeast is being released into the wild because in the future, it's cousins that remain are gonna burn up in a fiery death in my oven when I use them to bake bread. So I like to let some of the yeast kind of go back to nature by putting that in my compost. So it's been six hours since I fed the starter earlier today. Now let's take a look at this because this has now doubled in six hours. Yesterday, it took eight hours to double. Today, it took six hours. That's what you wanna see. That's the sign of a strengthening starter is the ability for it to double in height after a one, two, two feeding, ideally in four hours. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. Now here's day six before our feeding. Let's take a look. Now what you can see here is this is very flat, very bubbly. It's a little more liquefied than we saw yesterday. That's a good sign. That's a sign that the starter is strengthening because it's eating even more and more of the starches and sugars in the flour. When it really starts to liquefy, you get that shimmery kind of liquid on top. That's the ethanol or the alcohol. That means that this starter is eating all the food that it has, and we might have to actually increase the feeding ratio at some point if it gets any worse than this. But it is just now perfectly eating the amount of food that we're giving it. Okay, day six, I fed this starter four hours ago. Take a look at this, it's amazing. So this starter has more than doubled in four hours. On day six, after I created it, that is a very quick strengthening of a starter. It's uncommon. So if you're mixing your starter and it's not quite there yet, this is what I would typically see day seven, day eight, day nine, day 10. This starter really came on strong here. So this is really quick for a starter, six days to have your starter double in size like that within a four hour feeding. That's really the test of when your starter is ready. When it can double in height within four hours after a one, two, two feeding, that starter is really strong. Now, given that it's only day six, that's kind of early to be using a starter. I would recommend that you keep feeding this through day seven, day eight, day nine, day 10. Usually seven to 10 days is the recommended time before you wanna use a starter in baking. This one is doing really well at day six, but I would still give it a little bit more time because it's not just the rise of the starter that you're looking for, it's also developing the flavor of lactic acid bacteria. So this could sufficiently rise a loaf right now but it might not really have that flavor that you're looking for. So I'm gonna keep feeding this for a few more days. So the starter rose and fell on day six, now it's day seven. Now, if you take a look at this, now you wanna smell this every day as well. The smells are gonna change over time and, and you'll get all different types of smell in your starter. Someday it smells beautiful like a yeasty bread factory. Some days it smells like vinegar. Some days it smells like stinky cheese or a locker room. Uh, it just goes through different phases and it'll, it'll change some very different smells over, uh, you know, day to day, depending what temperature it's at, uh, can have a lot to do with the type of odor that's coming off of it. Don't panic if the smell changes. The smell is really not an indication of whether it's good or bad. It just goes through different cycles, depending on whether the lactic acid is dominating or the acetic acid is dominating or the alcohol byproduct of the uh, yeast is dominating. So you'll get some different smells coming out of your starter. But now you can see on day seven, this has really flattened out very small pinpoint holes. It's getting to the point where it's almost starving. It's just barely making it through this feeding cycle with enough food when it really flattens out and starts to liquefy like that. So I'm gonna do another one, two, two feeding today and then check this tomorrow and see if, if we need to increase the feeding ratio or not.
So it's day eight now. The starter is continuing to strengthen. It's rising and falling, but take a look at what it looks like now before I feed it. Super liquefied on top. That's ethanol or hooch. That's basically alcohol. That means the yeast is starving. So look how liquidy this is. So what you can see here is that this starter does not have enough food to last 24 hours until the next feeding using that one to two ratio. It's just barely running out of food. That's a good sign because it means I have a strong yeast population. The yeast has been reproducing through these seven or eight days. There's just more yeast in here. So it's eating more of the starches and sugars in the flour. So we have to think about, do we change the feeding ratio? So let's talk about starter feeding ratios now. So now if your starter is doubling like mine is after a one, two, two feeding, you're well on your way to having a great sourdough starter. Now you move into the maintenance phase of managing your starter. And the key thing is to figure out what you want to do in terms of your daily feeding ratio. So we built this starter using a one, two, two feeding ratio, and that's just barely enough food for the starter to make it 24 hours. My old starter, Clee from Cleveland, this one works fine with a one, one, one feeding ratio. So every day I take equal parts starter. I do 25 grams of starter, 25 grams of flour, 25 grams of water. It's just not as strong or as hungry of a starter. It's part of the reason that I built this new one. So when you think about the feeding ratio, what you're really trying to do is to say, if I want to do daily maintenance of my starter, which means I'm going to feed it once a day, keep it at room temperature on my countertop, for example, the feeding ratio is trying to figure out what's the optimal amount of food that you need to give your starter until you get to the next feeding. So I use what I call the camping analogy. So when you think of those three numbers in the starter ratio, one, two, two in this example, the first number is the population or the number of campers that you're sending out on a camping trip. The second number is the number of meals that you're sending with them. And the third number is the amount of water that you're sending with them. So in a one, two, two ratio, for each camper, I send two meals and two bottles of water. For my one, one, one ratio, I send one camper with one meal and one bottle of water. These campers come back and they haven't starved to death. They're fine using one, one, one in my Cleveland starter. My California starter, this is a little hungrier. It needs one, two, two. When I send the campers out, I got to send two meals and two bottles of water with each one of them. Now, when these guys came back, they are extremely hungry, as we could see on that video of what that looked like, where all the, the sugars had been consumed and you can start to see that alcohol forming on the top. So then I asked the question, if one, two, two is just barely enough, then I go up to one, three, three, or I could go one, 2.5, 2.5, but just to keep it easy, my next feeding, I'll try one part starter. So my 25 grams of starter, but now I need to send three meals and three bottles of water. So I do 75 grams of flour and 75 grams of water. And then I check it the next morning to see, did I give it too much food? Did I give it not enough food? What did the campers look like when they came back? So I did a one, three, three feeding on this. And when it came back 24 hours later, that was more than enough food. It was still actually kind of pasty. And I just didn't like the way that it looked when I came, when it came back with that one, three, three feeding, it was just too much food. And, and you're just ending up wasting flour if it's not kind of coming back in that hungry state. You want it to be hungry, which is flat and bubbly, but not starving, which is hoochie and liquefied. So I'm going to go back to the one, two, two feeding and monitor this for a while. One, two, two typically works. One of the other things that's happening here, as you could see from the thermometers that I'm using, this is at a pretty warm temperature right now, 78, 79 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 26 degrees Celsius. That also impacts the speed at which the starter eats the food. So I'm going to take this back down to one, two, two and monitor it for a while. I just didn't like the way that it, it looked with the one, three, three. It was too pasty and it didn't need that much food. 
So if your starter is doubling in height after say four, five, six hour feeding consistently at that one, two, two ratio, and your starter is at least seven days old, your starter is ready to bake bread with. I would just try it and see how it goes. It will continue to strengthen over time. It really takes, in my experience, about 30 days for the starter to come to full strength. And that's not just the ability for it to rise, but also the ability to develop that flavor. The lactic acid bacteria takes a little bit of time to kind of equalize with your yeast in your starter. After 30 days, the starter really settles in, in my experience. So good luck with your starter. If you have other questions, I have three other videos you might want to check out. One, how to maintain your starter. That goes through in detail how to do the daily maintenance. Number two is how to strengthen a weak starter. If your starter ever goes through a phase where it just starts to peter out and lose its strength, I have some tips for how to strengthen a weak starter. And number three is a humorous but educational video called 50 Ways to Kill Your Starter that talks about all the common mishaps that people have where they accidentally kill their starter. And I show many ways where you can revive a starter that you didn't actually kill, but it certainly looked like it. Good luck with your baking and thank you for watching my video.